All right, I'm going to actually get started with Muriel's um, introduction. Muriel is one of my super favoriteest um, scientists. Um, she's an economist, and I said, Muriel, what would be a fun fact to which I, you know I could allude to in your introduction? It's like fun economics. They don't really go together. Um, so uh, I will say that um, uh, Muriel grew up in, uh, I think Vienna, you said, right? But you were born in Paris, so she That's is right. multilingual, has a French first name, German last name, and um, we're all very excited for your talk, Muriel. So um, uh, thank you for being at BCFG, and I will go on mute, and you can share your slides. Thanks for having me. Um, let me, okay. So, um, you know, I think uh, maybe I think what I meant was that economists don't need jokes, which is fun anyway. So. <laughs> but anyway, I want to tell you about the importance of being competitive. And uh, this work is really based on, uh, you know, a lot of papers. And I'm going to give you a very, very quick uh, overview of some. And I want to end with, uh, with the last paper that is with Thomas Buzer and Hesler Osterbeck. Uh, that is our, our newest work on this uh, in this area. So we think of um, you know, this line of work as showing that we have a new trade uh, and we're gonna think about its predictive power and labor market output. In an economics, but not just in economics, also in uh, psychology, there's a growing literature, I guess for economics is kind of new, to assess the importance of trades in explaining labor market outcomes. Okay. And uh, obviously, you know, Angela's work on grid uh, is very famous. I think it's slowly making its way to economics, but uh, isn't really there yet. Uh, and economists mostly have focused on traits that they can also um, you know, say a bit more about in theory. And I think what I want to do today is I want to tell you about this trait that uh, we came up with, competitiveness, and uh, what its predictive power is and how it relates to some of the other traits that, that we have seen in the literature. Okay, so when we do this, uh, you can think of this as a bit of an interplay between the lab and the field. Okay, so we're going to need the field uh, to precisely show this new behavior trait and its robustness. And um, I'm going to show you how to measure this new trait competitiveness, and it is very, very robust. And then uh, we're going to use the field to show the economic relevance of competitiveness. Okay, whether competitiveness can help us understand the questions that we as economists are interested in, namely labor market outcomes. We're going to ask, is this even true in a representative sample? So in that sense, we're going to think of competitiveness as a trait that is important even beyond uh, interest in gender differences. And then, because I'm interested in gender, we're going to talk a little bit about the role in the gender gap of those outcomes. Okay, so that's going to be the plan for the next uh, 25 minutes. So to establish gender differences in competitiveness, uh, we're going to use experiments. And I think I'm preaching here to the converted, but just in case there's somebody who still needs some conversion. Uh, the advantages of experiments are obviously that we have a lot of control in the lab. Okay, we can control or use self-selection issues. We can measure performance perfectly. We don't have to worry about discrimination or belief discrimination because if we say in the lab that we're gonna pay you depending on how many problems you solve correctly, uh, that's gonna be the payment because in economics, we definitely cannot lie to subjects. So you don't have to worry that your problem might be worth less than somebody else's problem just because you are female or any other kind of minority. Furthermore, there are no issues of career concerns or time commitment. Okay, if you worry that women maybe don't go to science and engineering or that women uh, don't uh, have high level jobs because you know, they uh, have uh, time commitment issues, they wanna have children, maybe they wanna stay at home. You know, here we don't have to worry about this. This is a simple one hour experiment. You know, your choice is not gonna influence how much time you can spend with your kid later on. Now, importantly, the other advantage of experiments that are often a bit overlooked, and that is that they're easy to replicate and it's easy to check for their robustness. So how do we measure competitiveness? This is based on my paper with uh, uh, Lisa Westerlund uh, that was published uh, you know, now more than a decade ago. We had 80 college students from the University of Pittsburgh and from Carnegie Mellon. We put them in groups of two men and two women who performed a real effort task multiple times under different compensations. Uh, we never ever mentioned the word men and women. You know, we just put people in groups of four. We were very careful uh, in this first time that we showed this trait, something that we later on realized, you know, it's not necessary, but I think the first time you wanna show something, it's good to be kind of extra careful. 
And what we wanted to observe was the selection into a competitive environment. So ideally, therefore, we want to have a task where there's very little gender difference in performance and also tasks that people can do many times. So we invented this task of adding up five to digit numbers that kind of then took off a little bit on its own. Okay, so our subjects came to the lab. They were in groups of four, two men and two women. They could see that, but we didn't mention their gender. First, uh, they would be uh, paid according to a piece rate. So they, they would perform many times and one of the rounds would be paid. If the first round was paid, they would get 50 cents for every correctly solved problem. Okay, so here they are like adding up numbers for five minutes. They know at the end how many they solved correctly. So they're gonna know if this task counts for payment, they know how much money they lost. Second, we have a, a tournament. So now we tell them that in a group of two men and two women, we don't mention gender, but we're gonna say that in this round, if it counts for payment, we're gonna only pay one person. That's the person who solves the most problems in a group. That person is gonna get $2 per correct problem and everybody else is gonna get nothing. Okay. At the end of the tournament, I only know how many problems are solved correctly. I do not know if I won the tournament or who was the winner or how far away I was from winning the tournament. Now, our question of interest is this third round. Okay, so in the third round, they can choose the compensation scheme for the next five minute addition task. This can be either piece rate, in which case they get 50 cents for every correctly solved problem. Okay, so that's easy. Or they can choose to enter the tournament. Now for the tournament, we have to think a little bit on who they're gonna compete against. So what we do is we're gonna say, if you enter the tournament in round three, you're gonna compete against the performance of your group members in the previous tournament round, okay? So uh, as Angela said, I'm from Austria, we do a lot of downhill skiing. Suppose we all ski down the hill in the morning and then in the afternoon, I can ski down the hill again and my afternoon time could be counted against the morning time of all of my group members. Okay? The reason this is important is because in principle, I don't care what my group members do in the afternoon. So, or put differently, my choice has no impact on anybody's uh, payment in that third round. Okay. If my time is faster than my group members' times on the previous round, or if I solve more problems than my group members did in the previous round, I'm gonna get $2 for every correct problem and otherwise I get no payment. So as I said, this is an individual decision-making task my choice imposes no externality on anybody else. That means you don't have to worry that maybe women don't enter the tournament because they're afraid that the men are gonna lose and not make a lot of money. Okay, so uh, all of these considerations are not gonna play a role here. So what do we find? Well, we know how well participants did in the round two tournament where everybody was forced to compete. So we can ask how many of them actually would make more money from entering the tournament compared to entering the piece rate. Okay, and remember, if you have a performance of 20, say, you're almost guaranteed to win, in which case you would get $40 for this five minute addition task if you enter the tournament. If you enter the piece rate, you're gonna get you know, 50 cents per problem, so you're gonna get only $10. Okay, so there's a lot of people who will make much more money from the tournament than the piece rate, namely all the high performing participants. Given the round two performance, we would predict 30% of women 30% of men to gain from entering the tournament. Who actually enters? We found 35% of women and 73% of men to enter. Okay, what, you know, on the one hand, obviously this is terrible. Uh, on the other hand, it's great. You don't need a lot of fancy econometrics to show that this is significant. You know, this is like a huge, huge difference. So who are those men and women who are entering the tournament? I'm gonna show you, depending on the performance score time, whether they're the top 25% of participants, the you know, next 25% or the bottom 25%, what is the chance of men and women to enter the tournament? And remember, if you're on the top 25% chance, uh, percent of performers, you really should enter the tournament because you have a high chance of winning and making much more money. If you're on the bottom two quartiles, you really have no chance of winning. So your money maximizing choice will be not to enter the tournament. Okay, and what we find is that uh, basically men are entering at a much higher rate than women independent of the performance quartile. Okay, so compared to money maximizing choices, we're gonna have the high performing women who enter only the rate of you know, about 40%, 60% therefore losing a lot of money. On the other hand, we're gonna have the low performing men who enter the rate of 60% who are gonna lose money. Now, not that much because you know, if you have a performance of say 
seven problems, you basically have a choice between the piece rate of giving you a three and a half dollars or the tournament giving you like basically zero because you're gonna lose. Okay. Now, what is um, surprising on this one, or you know, what, what makes this, uh, I guess, a nice finding, is that independent almost of the performance level, the men are entering at a higher rate than the women. And even the worst performing guys have a higher chance of entering than the highest performing women. Performance is also not very uh, predictable of entry. It's weakly predictable for men, uh, but, but not for women. So what can account for this gender difference in competitiveness? Okay. Well, an obvious thing is gender differences in confidence. Okay. If I decide whether to enter the tournament, what matters is not just knowing my absolute performance, but my beliefs about my relative performance. Okay. Our participants only knew their absolute performance. So maybe, maybe men have a much higher belief on how good they are in their group compared to women. Okay. So indeed to assess this, we asked for beliefs on the relative performance in the round two tournament where everybody had to enter the tournament. And we found that beliefs indeed account for some of the gap, but not all of it. Now, a second trait economists are really familiar with that is gonna play a role here is potentially risk aversion. In the tournament, not only does your payment depend on the performance of others, but it's also more risky. There's a chance that I perform a lot, I put in some effort, and I'm not gonna get paid anything because I'm not winning the tournament. Okay, so it could be that the gender differences we observe are not driven by competitiveness, but really by risk aversion, and that this could account for this gender gap in tournament entry. So what we did in our paper is we had a choice where people didn't have to perform anymore, but still risk and beliefs uh, played a role. And we found that once we took out competition, we did not find big gender differences, suggesting that this was really competition that, that generated this, this big gap. So to summarize our really, I think it was our initial paper to measure competitiveness was we found that women decided not to enter tournaments because of this gender gap in competitiveness. About a third was accounted for by lack of confidence in one's ability. And then we had some minor effect of uh, aversion to feedback or risk aversion. So um, it turns out that you know, the nice thing of, of, this, of this lab experiment is that lots of people were uh, ready to replicate it. And uh, indeed I wrote several survey chapters, the last one published in 2016, where uh, we had to, you know, somewhat painfully look through all the papers that cited us and also kind of had experiments that were related to ours. And there were lots of papers that had uh, experiments exactly like ours with very small modifications and uh, 12 of them published at a time and three more where I have as a co-author. So, you know, it's still a replication, but maybe take this with a bit of a grain of salt. However, all of those found uh, similar effects with one exception, uh, actually that uh, th this guy actually wrote a second paper where he did find it again. So uh, in one subsample, he did not find it. There are also lots of papers that had designs that were very similar to ours in spirit, even if not in exactly the details that also found circumstances where women enter tournament less than men. Okay, so as a whole, I think experimental economics is relatively healthy there in that a lot of papers with varying co-authors have tried to replicate uh, our, our experiment and actually indeed have found similar results. Okay, so uh, replication, we can put a big, a big check mark. This seems to, be, uh, seems to be very robust. So now that we know how to measure this trade competitiveness, we wanna show that, you know, it's not just an interesting finding in the lab, but it actually can help us understand some of the outcomes we observe outside of the lab. Namely, you know, initially we were interested in gender differences in, in economic outcomes, but you know, in general, it could be that competitiveness might be a very useful trait to have to predict labor market outcomes and success. Okay? And especially we're gonna be interested whether this is true even in a representative sample. So we can think of this as showing that competitiveness is a trait relevant even you know, beyond just your interest in gender, but because I'm interested in gender, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what happens to the gender gap of those outcomes. So 
to look at this external relevance of competitiveness, I think the first paper that did this was really my work with uh, Thomas Bus and Hesle Osebeck, published about uh, you know seven years ago by now, where we correlate competitiveness with subsequent education choices of uh, ninth graders in four schools in and around Amsterdam. Here we showed that first competitiveness predicts education choices to like a shocking amount, in the sense that it almost outperforms gender. In, in this predictiveness. Obviously, gender is a very precisely measured zero one variable, more or less, whereas competitiveness is a very noisy zero one variable. Nonetheless, if you want to predict the choice of a child, you're almost better off knowing what they do in our little experiment compared to the actual gender. And furthermore, it accounted to 15 to 20% of the gender gap in choices. Okay. And then there were several other papers that looked at uh, whether a measure of competitiveness can predict career choices at the pre-academic level or also salaries and industry choice. And uh, you know, one uh, paper I want to maybe mention here is the paper by uh, Royben, Sabienza, and Singales in 2020, because they actually performed the very first replication of our experiment uh, because they did not believe our result with Chicago MBAs. They replicated our results perfectly. Uh, and you know, here's where economics is really bad. And they thought, therefore, they cannot publish it. So they put it in a you know, file drawer. Once we showed our uh, results on competitiveness predicting education choices, they remembered that they did this with Chicago MBAs. And they actually correlated the choices of Chicago MBAs in, in an experiment in the first year of the MBA program with earnings and industry choices afterwards and found some interesting correlation. OK, now I want to come to my most recent project where we're going to point out a little bit that is previous studies, unfortunately, you know, obviously very interesting, but they are really focused on high end, very small and very selected samples. Okay. And this limitation is probably perhaps almost inherent to using this incentivized choice experiment in the sense that it's very costly to have these three rounds of peace rate tournament choice. And it's probably difficult to, you know, just logistically cumbersome and kind of expensive to do this with a representative population. So what we want to do is we wanted to use on the one hand, a representative sample, but we're gonna use the list panel, uh, which is representative for that po Dutch population with yearly core questionnaires. And uh, what we did is we wanted to ask whether competitiveness does predict education labor market outcomes in a representative sample. Second, we wanted to find a cheap non-incentivized questionnaire alternative with similar predictive power. And third, we wanted them to compare what is the predictive power of competitiveness compared to other non-incentivized measures, such as B5, uh, risk aversion, and self-esteem. Okay. So how do we do our survey measure of competitiveness? Uh, we uh, basically, in 2017, added a question to the, to the list panel that basically said, how competitive do you consider yourself to be? please choose a value on a scale below where zero means not competitive at all and a value of 10 means very competitive, okay? So this is a very simple self-assessment question, clearly very cheap in the sense that it's just like one question uh, and, uh, and not incentivized. Now, a year later, we basically invited roughly half uh, of, the, of the people back, randomly chosen, to participate in an experiment that is based on needle of Estelon. Obviously, we can't ask them to add up numbers online, so we have to adapt the task a little bit, where we actually measure competitiveness in, a, in an experimental way you know, with incentives. OK, so the two measures are very highly correlated, even though, you know, I mean, obviously, that was our goal. But note that it's not obvious that they're going to necessarily uh, uh, predict the same thing, because one is kind of a general competitiveness measure, and the other one is really uh, a measure where it is about a specific task where they want to enter the tournament for this specific specific performance. Okay. Furthermore, the correlation across one year is you know 0.15. Now, um, you know, to give you some idea whether this is uh, large or not large, we can actually look at uh, the domain uh, uh, FIC. Uh, risk question, uh, which is just, you know, do you consider yourself to be averse to risk or how, how willing are you to take risks? And when you ask that exact same non incentivized question, 
a year apart, you get a correlation of 0.4. Now, we don't ask exactly the same question, right? We have a verbal question and then a very incentivized, very specific task uh, measure of competitiveness. Nonetheless, we get about 40% of the correlation of the exact same risk question uh, a year apart. Okay, so in that sense, I think it's actually uh, quite correlated. But more importantly, we want to know whether this verbal question predicts the same outcomes in the same sample as our experimental question. Okay, so first we want to know, does the experimental question predict the outcomes we're interested in, which is going to be kind of the four major outcomes you're going to look at in this list panel. And second, does the experimental question, the, the verbal question predict those same outcomes in that same sample? Mm -hmm. It's not enough to show that these two are correlated. We really want to know whether they help us understand who is making more money, who is more likely to be a boss or have high education level. So these are the four outcomes we look at, income, occupation level, meaning are you a boss or do you have a boss? And education level, where condition going to university, we're also gonna ask about college major, where we're gonna rank majors a little bit by income. And then our controls are these big five personality traits uh, of like 10 questions for each trait, uh, risk preferences and self-esteem, general confidence and confidence in experimental tasks. Okay, so let's think about competitiveness and income first. And we're gonna use here the incentivized measure. So we know people who enter the peace rate, those who enter the tournament. We have it here divided by men and women, just because uh, like everywhere, you know, men make higher salaries. So we wanted to show it to you uh, by gender separately. You can also lump them together. The big just not gonna change that much. Fifth quintile, these are gonna be the people who make the most money. One are gonna be the ones who make the least money. And we're just gonna ask, conditional on being in the first or the you know, quintile, how many people enter the peace rate and uh, how many people enter the, the competition. Okay. And this is what you find. So uh, conditioning on entering the peace rate, you are much more likely to be in the lower end of the salary distribution compared to when you enter the tournament. And that is true for both uh, men and women. So this is our experimental measure. Now let's see how this stacks up to our uh, uh, questionnaire measure. Here is our questionnaire measure on competitiveness. So above, I just replicated the experimental measure and below, I looked at the questionnaire measure where we divide people by above and below median. And uh, we're gonna just ask, you know, condition of being below median, what's your income? And condition of being above the median, what is your income? Okay, and you can find patterns that are very similar across these two uh, uh, questions, whether we have the incentivized version or the unincentivized version. Now, is this just a figure? Obviously, figures <laughs> speak a lot of words, but uh, at some point as economists, we also wanna look at regressions. Here's a simple or less regression. You can also become more fancy. It doesn't really change that much. Uh, the average monthly income is about 2,456 euros. And if you are competitive, you make about 300 more euros uh, than if you enter the peace rate. And this is true almost independent of how much you control for. And then uh, remember our questionnaire measure, instead of a binary variable, it's a, it's a, it's a variable from one to 11. So, uh, you know, we, we have somewhat, uh, somewhat different uh, scales here in terms of the predictive power. Okay, now let's think about uh, competitiveness in your occupation level. So here we have higher occupation levels, meaning being a boss on the right, unscaled on the left, and you get a similar pattern. Uh, if you are entering the peace rate, you are more likely to have a boss than if you are entering the tournament. Same thing when you look at our verbal measure instead of our incentivized measure. And again, regressions confirm that basically uh, both of those measures are very predictive. And, uh, and again, you know, you have to kind of take into account that this obviously differs. Uh, in one case, we have a binary measure. In the other case, we have a measure from one to eight. Okay. Uh, we also look at education level and college major. We find that competitive people are much more likely to have gone to college and condition having gone to college are more likely to have graduated in medicine, STEM, economics, and business, which are high income degrees and less likely to have majored in nursing or humanities, which are low income degrees. Uh, we also find, so now, you know, the next thing we want to do, let's see, I'm running here a bit short on time. I'm going to try to speed up. So you want to compare our measure to other non-incentivized measures. Okay, so how are we gonna do this? Well, what we can do is we can use a method inspired by Heckman et al. We're gonna say, let's hold all the other traits constant and we're gonna move someone from the bottom 
of that trade to the top 30% of that trade, holding everything else constant. And then we're going to do this for one trade at a time. Okay. So here is income and competitiveness. If you move from the bottom 30% to the top 30% of competitiveness, you make on average another 300 euros holding all the other trade constants. Here are the big five. Okay, so the big five are always important. Remember, this is conditional education. So intellectual openness while predicting education does not have additional predictive power once you control for education. And you can see that our competitiveness measure stacks up really well, even with the best of the big five, where each big five has a, has a 10, uh, 10 question questionnaire behind it, whereas we just have one simple question. And here is risk, uh, confidence in general, and self-esteem, which are other things economists have, have looked at. Okay. Here's the same thing when we look at occupation level. Again, uh, you know, uh, our variable, I think, does, does really well compared to other variables. And uh, I'm going to skip today. Results on gender, obviously, super exciting. However, in the interest of time, I'm just going to flash you the, the most exciting stuff. Basically, competitiveness is you know, has a major, has, you know, maybe not a, a very large, but still very significant uh, effect on accounting for the gender gap uh, in, in economic outcomes. And I'm also going to skip competitiveness versus risk seeking. But one way to show you that competitiveness is really different from risk seeking is that, well, first of all, remember, risk seeking didn't really predict some of the outcomes they looked at very much. But second, risk seeking has shown to predict four outcomes in a previous study, which is investing in stocks, practicing sports, being self-employed and smoking. And all of those, you know, apart from maybe practicing sports, we don't think of as being competitive. And indeed our risk preference measure predicts those four outcomes that so we replicate dominant R and only practicing sports is also predicted by um, competitiveness whereas competitiveness has nothing to say about the other ones, okay? The dark side of competitiveness also skipped today. We really looked hard for a dark side of competitiveness, but you know, basically we didn't really found some. Uh, competitive people seem to be happier, uh, have better family and social life, less selfish, you know, so it's just a, a, a fantastic trade overall. So to end, uh, our needle of Estelon experimental measure of willingness to compete strongly predicts career outcomes in the representative sample conditional range of other traits. And in that sense, we think of competitiveness now transcending gender. I think it just got an interest on its own and it accounts for a modest but significant part of the gender gap in those outcomes. And I think the second important thing we did is to elicit and validate a simple survey measure of competitiveness that predicts the incentivized choice, but more importantly, predicts the same outcomes in the same sample as our incentivized choice and outperforms many other traits and also predicts gender differences better than most other trends. Thank you. Thank you, Muriel, that was great. Sorry, I'm like pouring through our wonderful questions. Um, and so interesting to see this new data and also some of your classic studies on this. So thank you for sharing it. We have lots of interesting questions. I'm going to do something um, a little mean, which is jump the line with my own question, and then I'll ask some other people's. Uh, what I was wondering about, and it looks like I'm not the only one actually, I think Gabriel uh, Vogel has a similar question. I couldn't help but wonder if we know anything about what possibly could repair the gap. Um, and if you can say anything about that, I, my mind immediately went to sort of like, if we get women more involved in sports, is yeah. that a thing that can close the gap? Do we know anything? And can you say anything about like what policies might be able yeah. to repair this problem? So you're know, focusing on the gender part of that, uh, of that competitiveness, or, you know, what do we do with this? Or either, of... actually, because we want men who are non-competitive and losing out on the labor yeah. market to get better yes. outcomes too. Perfect. So one route to go would be to make less competitive people more competitive. Now, to be honest, I don't know how to do that. Uh, it's also a little bit close to the fixing the woman kind of, you know, <laughs> solution, which I'm a bit wary of. And indeed, I have some work showing that it's not always the right solution. I can really, really backfire. I think another way to think of that would be to ask, you know, why is competitiveness so predictive? And we find that, um, for example, some um, way of organizing our education system, especially in Europe. So we have, you know, we love these once and for all choices where you have to choose you know, what you're gonna be already in high school at some, to some extent. 
So these once and for all, you know, single track choices seem to be not just selecting on how good you are in certain fields, but also on competitiveness. Okay, so there, there seem to be some education choices or some think of choice architectures that reward the trade you're interested in, but also reward competitiveness, which you might not have been interested in to begin with. And then of course you just, you know, don't want to magnify differences in this trade, even though that's not what you were looking for. So we're actually now working to show that uh, indeed having very unflexible uh, school choices compared to flexible school choices may have uh, a big impact on the gender gap in education and on whole labor market outcomes afterwards. So I, I believe a little bit more in thinking about uh, changing the environment and trying to understand where these traits can you know, be a, a hurdle or a problem depending on how we design the choice architecture. Uh, I also have some recent work on, on an affirmative action quotes where we show that these quotes can have really huge effects or trickle down effects on, on all, all kinds of players, not just the ones that are kind of chosen. Uh, for the ones meaning like a quota where uh, women have to compete or something. You have to have as many women competing as men or something along those lines. Uh, along those lines, it's uh, one out of nine or one out of eight. It turns out <laughs> so it's already the the big push. <laughs> that is, uh, right. Yeah. Right. So know, it even expects small change has a big impact. That's yeah. really interesting. Okay, thank you. Um, lots of other questions. So let me plow forward. This is a, a, this goes in the opposite direction. So Don Moore. Um, who, who we, we both know um, from Berkeley yeah. said, um, more competitiveness is not necessarily good. Plenty of overconfident male entrepreneurs compete too much for their own good. Can you talk about any dysfunctional effects that you found? Yeah, so we, we really tried, no? because a lot of people ask us this question. And I think, I think it may also have to do a little bit with the word competitiveness that somehow um, uh, you may have a, a darker side in English than in, in some other languages. So we do not find that competitiveness is associated with worse traits. Uh, we really looked hard because a lot of people ask us this. Now, this doesn't mean that at the very, very top, you know, it could be good for you and then at some point it could be bad. So that, that could be true. We just may, you know, don't have enough, uh, enough to kind of show that. Um, but as I said, we really looked hard. And if anything, we found that they are you know, less likely to be depressed, happier, uh, you know, no less likely to have a partner if it close to others. If anything, give more importance to being helpful and loving. So yeah, we did not find really, the dark side. Really interesting. I'm sure Don would love to talk offline if you haven't already measured overconfidence and whether it's correlated with that. But- um, uh, that, Good question, yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, the, but yeah. It, that actually brings me to the next question I was gonna ask, which is from um, Lyle Unger, who's a, professor here at, um, at Penn in the computer science department. And he is curious about the correlations between some of the things you measured specifically, how competitiveness correlates with the big five. Yes, so um, they do seem to be quite distinct traits in the sense that when you add up all of those variables, you often get more you know, get, than, than if you just have one of those. Um, we don't find, yeah, so we have a table on correlations, which I don't have in the talk here. Uh, so, but, but we don't find that competitiveness is, you know, just might be an overstatement, but it's, it's, not, it's not a summary of some of the things we have already known, but seems to be really quite distinct. Um, yeah. Wonderful. Um, okay, super interesting. So uh, let's see, um, Weehan uh, Ung, asked, do you have any thoughts or predictions about how gender differences in competitiveness might shift when competing to secure benefits for the self or others or both? And, um, mm -hmm. and the thinking comes right from the work on negotiations that yes. you know well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so uh, yeah, that's a great question. We actually, at some point, started looking at this. Um, uh, so I don't know. Uh, there's one paper that suggested this might be the case. Now, unfortunately, um, you have to be really careful in controlling for um, the incentives. So, for example, you know, so suppose we, we say, okay, instead of having money for you, you can just have money for charity. Okay, one easy reason to get the gender gap to disappear is that men don't care about charity. So uh, they're not entering the tournament. So you really have to think about to pick something where you can also measure that both men and women care equally much about that other person. Uh, and then... Uh, show precisely that even controlling for how much you care about that other person, uh, you do find or do not find gender differences. So uh, 
I think it could be smaller. Um, there's definitely evidence that suggests that this might be the case, but I haven't seen a really great study on this yet. So I think more work needs to be done. And I think it's, an, it's a great question. So something, honestly, that, you know, if somebody is listening here and looking for in, inspiration of something to do, I think that would be like a great thing to do with, you know, however this caveat of really being careful in measuring or making sure that both men and women equally value, uh, you know, who they're competing for, the money they receive, you know, behalf of the others. Okay, this is a related question. Uh, so you may also say more research is needed, but I think it's an interesting one. And it's a little different. And so I'm going to raise it. It's from um, Amit Kumar, and he's asked of UT, and he's asking, um, in many economic contexts, he says cooperation often provides greater long term benefits than competition. And he is wondering if you'd expect gender differences in these situations such that women are more willing to cooperate than men. Meaning, would women have an advantage in these kinds of situations where cooperation is actually the ideal behavior to, to come yeah. out on top? So, um, you know, especially when you think of altruism, uh, which is not exactly the same as cooperation, but, uh, you know, there might be a reason why women are more likely to be nurses. But on the other hand, you know, that could also have been true for doctors. And uh, at least for a long time, you know, women were much less likely to be doctors uh, and uh, often hold the, the lower earning parts of those jobs. You know, they're more likely to be family doctors than like surgeons who are really the ones who make, who make the most money. Now, the other thing is that um, if you have single sex tournaments, <laughs> women are also very, very competitive. So it is not that women never compete. They just seem to really not compete against men. It's really interesting. Um, okay, let's see. I'm looking through. There's so many good questions. Uh, okay, this one I know you have an answer to, so I'll bop it up. Uh, Samil Sahin asked, did you see any difference in, com in competitiveness when men compete against other men instead of women? And similarly, when women compete against other women instead of men, which is jump building off of what you just said. Yes. Yeah, so men kind of don't care against whom they compete, but women uh, really, really care. And uh, uh, which also shows that, you know, it's not like a broad trait that is, you know, I mean, maybe maybe it's, like, I'm not gonna enter the nature nurture debate, but uh, it's not that the women don't know how to compete at all or kind of really, really hate it. And that's why they're not doing it. It's just, um, it's just a competition with men seems to be what is kind of the most difficult for them. Okay, this is an interesting question from Tim Dirksen. Tim is asking if you could speculate a bit for group dynamics, do you think it helps to have both comp uh, competitive and non-competitive people by creating more group cohesiveness or would in-group competing with the out-group be more important? So I guess like sort of an evolutionary take on this. Yeah, so uh, yeah, as economists, we really are really bad in answering kind of these more complicated questions. Uh, I know there has been some work where you could decide on a partner where, uh, however, then uh, basically your joint performance was kind of, you know, there was not a lot, there was not a lot of interaction in finding out what's the right thing to do. And they are competitive people wanted competitive people because they kind of wanted to win the, the tournament that they were participating in as a group. Um, you know, there's some, there's some work on whether it is better to have groups that are uh, similar or more different from each other. I think it probably depends a little bit on what you do. I mean, you know, in economics, we have a lot of co-authors. On the one hand, it's great to have co-authors like you because they really understand what you want to do. On the other hand, it's sometimes very good to have co-authors who are different because they are very good at doing things that you're not good at. So I think, you know, probably the answer is going to be a little bit of both. I think it's probably hard to answer this in general. It's probably, you know, the, the preferred economic answer is it depends. <laughs> fair enough fair enough okay um so i think you you touched on this a little bit when you mentioned the work on affirmative action and how impactful that could be and i totally share your desire to see more structural solutions rather than you know fix the women's solutions um we have an anonymous attendee who's asked if you've explored messaging at all in these tournaments and pointed to uh software like text io that tries to leverage gender neutral and inclusive language to attract different kinds of candidates. I'm going to just say that as a jumping off point for yes. affirmative action is one thing you mentioned, yeah. like, are there things like messaging or changing structures that you would point us to that um, could help? Yeah, so there hasn't been, you know, it's obviously, these are all great questions. You know, as economists, we, we don't start <laughs> answering this is a great question, but just in case I didn't, uh, these are all great questions. Um, 
we haven't been, you know, there hasn't been that much work in trying to uh, phrase the environment differently or, um, you know, nudge women to compete. Um, you know, I guess one, one thing to say is that this work is still relatively young. You know, I mean, we started this, the first paper was published in 2007, which, you know, might be ancient for some of you. But it's really not, not that old compared to some of the other trades uh, in economics. I, I'm not aware of anybody trying this um, apart from, you know, structurally changing uh, the whole environment. You know, people have tried more uh, female tasks. Uh, those also seem to generate a smaller difference. Uh, it's you know, the papers vary a little bit, mostly because we kind of don't really know what female oriented tasks are. You know, some, some verbal tasks seem to work and that's kind of less well. And I don't think we really have a good handle on why or why not, uh, but that would be probably uh, the most close. There's also some work asking, you know, suppose you do this for many, many rounds, right? So you have one round of competition and then afterwards I can tell you, look, actually, you know, we can even do it more extremely. We could say, you know, if only you had entered, you would have made money. You know, so it's uh, so think of a pairwise competition. You get matched with somebody else every round, and we can tell you, you know, this is how much money you made. And if you had made a different choice, you know, that's how much money you would have made. Where really you only need to know what would have happened if you had entered the tournament, because you always know what you get if you do the piece rate. It's just like you know half of your performance. And in that paper, so it's actually a work by Thomas Buzer. He finds that if anything, the gender gap kind of increases. So women, when they lose, that's it, you know, they're gone. Uh, and they never come back, even if they were told several times that, you know, they would have won this competition, they would have won that competition. Whereas men, when they lose, you know, they're very happy to come back. Um, really so in that sense, you know, I think it would be interesting to think of how this relates to grit or some of the other psychological traits uh, that people have looked at, you know, especially, you know, Ira Dwarton. That's really interesting. Okay, so we're basically out of time. So let me like, let me, uh, but I'm gonna ask you a final question, final Jeopardy, because I'm really curious, you know, this has been such a programmatic presentation. Your work on this is very programmatic. And I'm curious what you feel is like the burning question you next most want to address in this literature. Like, where are you going with your next papers? Uh, well, you know, I'm hoping to first finish my other papers. <laughs> <laughs> right, aren't we all? It's a I think, I think it would be very interesting to try to understand this concept of competitiveness a little more. I think, you know, going into the more psychological route on what's the correlation with some of these other traits and, uh, you know, is, is it something? So in the Netherlands, you know, the problem is that we don't have the sports in Europe like you have in the US where like, you know, half the kids are participating in sports. So we couldn't really do that, but it could be interesting to understand whether uh, kids that were in environments where they're more prone or, or more natural to sports, whether they are more competitive than others. I, I think that would be nice to understand. I think the other side, which I have been focusing a bit more lately, is to think of this behavior market design or choice architecture on how competitiveness interplays with some of the choice architectures that we observe and how some of those may contribute to the gender gap in economic outcomes and, and potentially how to, to change them. Um, I think for me, that's, I think almost, a, you know, also a very exciting kind of more economics part uh, to think of um, institutional choices or changes that, that we could do. I love that. And I think so many of our questions were about that. So I think this audience obviously loves that too. That's a great answer. Thank you so much for sharing this work with our group and, um, and also for coming day after Easter, which I know is a hard day to, you know, <laughs> <laughs> motivate to get a lot done. We appreciate it. Uh, next week for everyone, just so you know, we'll have Duncan Watts um, presenting on the effects of, ta of task complexity on group synergy. So that should be a really wonderful presentation as well. And look forward to seeing many of you there. Thank you so much, um, Muriel, and hope you'll join us next week as well. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye.